we're always looking for volunteers. Um, and the front of, at the front table, we have the sign-up sheet for the Western New York Sportsman Show and Expo, which is the week of um, the March 8th, 9th, and 10th, I believe. We're looking for volunteers for that. Um, see Brian, and he'll, uh, he'll set you up. Uh, we have a couple of just announcements from some folks. Is anybody here from the Erie County Federation of Sportsmen? The president or no? He was going to join us tonight. I, I don't think he's here yet. No. But I'm going to turn it over to Jerry from the Springville um, Pond Restoration Group to talk about an event he's going to be doing shortly after ours. Thanks, Joe. Many of you guys know me. I've been around a little bit. Uh, I'm with uh, Springville Field and Stream and uh, the Springville Trout Pond Restoration Project. So out in Springville, we've got a three-acre pond that uh, we've uh, had for many years. And if you've been from Springville area, that's where the kids go on the first day of uh, trout season every year. Did it when I was a kid. Uh, spent 40 years in Alaska, and when I retired, I said, you know something, we're going to rebuild the trout pond. So it's a volunteer effort. All the money we raise is volunteer. Um, we don't spend money on equipment. We don't spend money on labor. We spend money on to get the job done. So for five years, we've sponsored the International Fly Fishing Film Festival at the Joyland Theater in Springville. It's on a Tuesday night, and it's a family event. I had a great time at the Ridge last year, um, especially after everybody got into a few, you know, it's a four-year-old beer kind of place. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, way different, but you'll have fun there. If you want to come to a family event, that's what the film festival is about at, in Springville anyway. Starts at 6 o'clock. Um, Trout Unlimited will be there. Fly Fisherman will be there. Water Keepers will be there. Erie County Rail Trails. Um, some of those folks will be there. $15, but uh, just see me or if I'm not here um, because I have to take a call um, at 7 o'clock. Uh, I'll leave some more tickets still up with, uh, with the fellas up front. So it's a good time. Uh, bring the grandkids with you, and uh, you'll have a good night. So thanks. You're welcome. Okay, last but not least, I have to open up the floor for uh, our elections. Um, our elections will be held next month. There's a, uh, four board positions available. Um, there, it's a two-year term. The terms that are up are for Chuck Campbell, uh, Bill Jedlika, Nick Sagdabeni, and... Oh, Dave Dank, who, who took over for um, uh, Gary Coons. I don't know if you know Gary. He was a longtime board member, and he ended up stepping down because of personal reasons and, and work, and Dave took it over. I don't know if Dave is here, but he, he's going to, it's kind of logistics. He's got to run uh, again in March, even though he took over the position effective March 1st. So those four positions are available. Um, we also have four officers. Ken Kanicki, Vice President, Tony Messina, our Treasurer, uh, myself as uh, Vice President, and Dave Unetich as Secretary. So right now I'm opening up to the floor for anyone that's uh, interested in nominating someone, or you can even nominate yourself. Um, if anyone's interested in running, raise your hand and don't do it all at once. <laughs> all right. Okay, um, that's about it. If the gentleman from the, the Federation comes here, I may uh, have him just step in quick because he's got to be in Springville at 7.30, but I, I don't know if he's going to make it. Um, with that being said, we have one more item on our electroshocker. Fundraiser. Thanks, Joe. Nice to see everyone. I'm Ken Kanicki, Vice President. We are, uh, there's a project ongoing. It started last year when I went to Albany and met with uh, Trout Unlimited people uh, from across the state. And uh, we talked to them and said, is there something that you guys would really be interested in um, where you need some help, some financial help? And they were like, boy, we, we could really use one of these electroshocking units so that we can go out to the streams and do surveys and check to see what fish are there. Took us a little while to get our ducks in a row, but we now, through Kyle's uh, help, we've got this uh, 
fundraising going on. The flyers are here. Uh, they're going to be in the store. They're going to be on the website. They're going to be at Cabela's. Uh, you can scan this uh, QR code. There's a website address you can go to. Uh, if anyone wants to send in an actual check, we have the address in a form, tax acknowledgement form for that. Um, the uh, budget on this was around 14,000 and we've already had 8,000 committed from various places. We're also reached out to some corporate entities. Um, Cabela's is gonna help out. Uh, I think Trout Unlimited is gonna help out. But if we can get everyone to pitch in on this, it's really gonna um, go a long way towards helping Trout Unlimited here in Western New York and even in this region um, do some really important work. And this isn't just work for like a year. This kind of equipment will probably be around for quite a few years and, and it, it'll, I'll be gone and hopefully people will still be using it. So again, if, you, uh, if you'd like to donate, the, these are gonna be here in the store and on our website. Uh, anything that you can do there would help us out. We'd appreciate it. Ken, you wanna just give them a little uh, tutorial on electroshocking for people that don't know? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit. They, the, the unit goes out, uh, it either will float or it can go like on a backpack, and it sends a current through the water with these wands, and it sort of stuns the fish. The fish are stunned and they float up to the surface, and then there's other people coming in behind with nets to collect them. And what a lot of what Trout Unlimited does, or the DEC or other conservation groups, they then can study the fish. Uh, you can take uh, the size and the length, and you can take some scales and have more uh, like DNA type stuff done on them. But it's a it's a way to go ahead and gauge. You can't like go through a whole mile of stream, but if you go through a number of sections of stream, and you get so many fish across so many feet, you can extrapolate that out to like fish per mile or fish per acre, and then it tells you. How, how the streams are doing. Are we getting natural reproduction? Is the stock fish actually surviving? There, there's a lot of information and it's really important um, for, for the fishermen, but also for the life of the stream, the conservation of the stream. And that's why it, it, it will last, usually these shockers last for uh, quite a few years. And hopefully for many years we'll be able to uh, help improve the trout fishing in this area. For the whole system, everything involved. Like I said, we're more than halfway there. Actually, if I could add one thing. Um, after talking with Scott Cornett, uh, we found out that there's a better company to go to. So we could potentially get two for the price of the one. Uh, which would greatly help the uh, fishing effort. I can give you one of the forms and a, a couple of the tax forms if you'd like as well. Scott Cornett, if you don't know who Scott Cornett is, maybe you introduce him, but he's a great guy. He's really knowledgeable and he supports us uh, fishermen. He's the Region 9 uh, fisheries manager uh, for this area, and his wealth of knowledge on trout and trout streams in our area is unbelievable. So thanks, everyone. Ken, is that form up at the front desk? They're right in here at the fly tying table if you want to stop by and grab some. Yeah, okay, hey, Jim. Just one quick thing. Um, just in case anybody was wondering, um, between the two, the, the two fly film events, these are two different films. So we are we're not, not in competition. Um, the, the, the International Fly Fishing Film Festival, and then what we show is another uh, fly film festival called the, um, the Fly Fishing Film Tour. So it is two separate movies, two separate events. There's no reason why you can't go to both. So.
All right, we're ready to roll here with Wildlife Rescue 101. Get the tiger, Margie. <laughs> Hello? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We gotta keep it this close. My name is Margie Hanrahan. I'm from Messenger Woods. This is Tina Miller. She's actually the president of Messenger Woods, and Noreen Olick, who is actually one of the founding members of Messenger Woods. Um, today I'm going to make you sit through a very long presentation before you get to see the birds. No. So what we're trying to do is just because it's spring, a lot of times people, this is the time when people are finding baby birds, baby animals, things like that. Um, all the animals are in heat, so they're going and getting hit by cars because they're all out traveling. So I'm just going to try to rip through these slides really fast for you because I know you really just want to see the birds. And my tech guys. Okay, here we go. So my goal today is just to help you find out if an animal is in distress because a lot of times people will steal baby birds from the wild not knowing any better. Um, I'm not going to sit here and read all these slides to you. I'm just going to rip through them really quickly so we can um, get to the good part. So basically, we're not trying to tell you to go out and rescue animals. Some of these animals are dangerous. You can pick up a great horned owl and it can seriously injure you. Uh, wild animals are not pets. They can injure you. They can transmit diseases. And a lot of times people will try to help an animal by feeding it something that they're not supposed to and actually make it worse than if they just called for help. We're all licensed volunteers. We're licensed by the DEC and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we don't receive any compensation. Wildlife rehabilitation is super time consuming. It is a volunteer activity and a, like a, people call it a hobby, but it's really kind of a passion for us. Um, the animals require special training, licenses and caging. So when you're calling someone and they tell you that they can't take an animal for some reason, be kind to them because you don't know what they, what they have at their houses. We actually have a whole hospital, but we individually used to rehab, rehabilitate out of our houses, so it was very difficult, so we came together to do this. It's illegal to take care of wildlife without a license, except for starlings, pigeons, and house sparrows. So those three you could actually do yourself. So basically, how can you help? I always tell people, just observe. If you can observe, you can do wildlife rehabilitation 101. You're gonna look for visual symptoms of unresponsiveness. If you walk up to an animal and it doesn't move and it normally would take off, you know there's a problem. If it's confused or stressed out, if it's weak, the eyes are, are looking abnormal, they're closed and they're glassy, you can tell from that if their fur or feathers are out of place or if their wings or legs are not symmetrical. So if you're looking at a bird straight on and his wings look like this, they should be like this, you know he's got a problem. So here I'm just gonna go through some pictures. Obviously the guy on the left, he's unresponsive, he's stressed out, he looks weak, his eyes are closed, he's bent over, he's not healthy. After he was in rehabilitation, that's what he looks like now. So you can tell just by looking at an animal what's going on. Here's another, this is a little hawk that had gotten out of a nest, knocked out of a nest. He was on the ground, unresponsive, he has his head under his wings. He's just trying to be like, you know, leave me alone basically. His eyes are half masked and he can barely stand. Here he is trying to kick my ass. This was afterwards, he's fine now. So he, now you can tell the difference, like that's a normal behavior. I went up to him and he's like, get away from me. Now, if you ever see an animal that has yellow jackets, flies, or ants on it or around it, it needs help. So if it's just sitting there and it's like, he looks fine, and there's flies flying around him, he has some sort of injury because flies are the first indicator of blood. And if a cat, if you have a cat, people tell me all the time, they, my cat caught a bird or a chipmunk or whatever, but it's not hurt, he, he's a gentle cat. <laughs> Even a gentle cat picking up an animal has sharp teeth, and those little teeth basically inject into the skin and they have castorella in their mouth and it will cause an animal to die within three days. So even if you don't think it needs help, it does. So the things to look for are obviously bleeding, infection, dehydration, any allergic reaction, a spinal or head injury, and burns. So most of these things cause hypovolemic shock, shock which is basically blood and fluid loss based on normally you get like animals hit by cars. So that's where you're seeing, and that's an obvious injury. So what can you do to save something? You just gotta do three things. Warm, dark, and quiet. That saves so many animals. Now, people are like, okay, he's warm, it's 80 degrees outside. Well, think about you, if you were hit by a car or something physically happened to you, what happens? You're usually cold. Your, your blood rushes to your inner organs and tries to keep your body warm and all your extremities are cold. That happens with animals too. So you have to create the heat, not just say it's 80 degrees, he's fine. To do that, you can put a heating pad on low, 
You can fill water bottles with hot water, put them up against your face. If they feel warm, then you can use that to put next to them. I usually put the water bottles in a sock so they don't roll over something small. Um, Ziploc baggies you can use, fill them with hot water. Gloves, after COVID, we all have the gloves and things. Or a desk lamp or an animal in a box. The other thing is to reduce the visual stressors. Everybody has a box with Amazon packages now, or a paper bag or a laundry basket, just throw a towel over it. And then keep the noise away. The noise scares animals really badly. So your children, even though it's like, oh, this is a beautiful little, it's like an alien to them. And then you can call for help. So there's an organization now called Animal Help Now Online, which has all the numbers for a bunch of rehabilitators all over the United States. You can call the DEC, dog catchers, police departments, pet stores, social media. Just put it out there. Someone, there's so many rehabilitators now that there used to be 25 years ago that you'll find help. So which baby birds need help? <laughs> Precocial babies are ones that have um, lost their parents usually. When you get these in, they're single. They're little, the fuzzy little chick guys. They follow their parents, and they're not fed like a normal Robin would be fed by the mom bringing bugs to them. They can eat on their own immediately. And these single babies come into rehab because they've gotten, you know, either chased and scattered off by themselves, or they might be a, uh, a lagger when one egg lap hatches after everybody else does. And then the other kinds of babies, which are altricial baby birds, those are the ones that fall out of the nest or have other injuries because someone cuts a tree down, things like that. Um, they have to be fed. So those are the ones that you see like a robin's nest or something like that in your yard. Uh, you can just warm them up in your hands and then put them back in the nest. So can I ask you a quick question? Yes. So like you had mentioned, there's three birds that you are only allowed to do. And I did call my department and they weren't able to do anything. I kept taking care of a baby crop. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's technically it's illegal. <clears throat> you have 48 hours to turn wildlife, wildlife over to well, I did do that, but they didn't have availability. Like you had said, sometimes they don't have availability. Yeah, they don't. So you would have, I mean, your options really are die. limited. Yeah. Your <laughs> options are limited, and you would have, but like I always tell people. Exactly. I don't know anything about it, or t try to find other rehabilitators and farther out, or the SPCA will put down animals if they are overflowed. So I don't they have live. a good answer for that. They live. Um, <laughs> And I'm not going to do this. Or you can call, you can call the DC too, and see if you can find someone to take over. The problem is, though, there are. This is why we ended up building this hospital because it's so time-consuming, and a person takes on so many animals, and they can only do so many. So that's probably what's you know happening to you. Excuse me. Yes. Could you go back and talk about number four, please? Number four. Oh, the baby birds. Like, people always think that if you yeah. touch a baby bird, sorry, the biggest myth, right? yeah, it is the biggest myth. And I think parents did that so they would, their kids would stop bringing birds home. I have no idea where that came from. Because you can pick up a baby bird, and the parents will be flying around crazy over that, warm it up in your hands, or put it on the heat source and get it warmed back up, and then put him back in the nest, and the parents will go right back and feed it. Yeah, that's an, that's an old wives' tale about that touching baby birds. And same thing with bunnies, too. People the baby bunnies, take your baby bunnies out of the nest, put them back too. Now, when the whole nest falls down for you, what you can do is just get like a cooler container or those strawberry containers or whatever and put the nest, even though it's busted up, put it back in there, warm the babies up, put them back in, and I always use zip ties. I love the zip ties. Zip tie it onto a tree, make sure there's holes in the bottom so that it drains, and put it back as close to where the nest came down as you can. As long as the birds are up and cheeping, you can move it quite far and that parent's got to come down and feed it. Well, I know oh, you just know use the nest. You don't put anything else in it. Is that what you're saying? Don't line with grass? Yeah, don't don't line it with like wet. Like people use yeah. grass. Try to use the nest because it like when the rain goes through it, yeah. it goes through it. It's like straw. Yeah, it doesn't soak it up. Yeah, yeah. grass is very wet. People always like take a bunch of grass and then it just chills the birds. Mm -hmm. if, um, if you can't put a nest back, I always tell people we're not supposed to teach people to feed them and all whatever, but like you said, nowadays, you know, on the internet, you can look up something and figure out how to do it yourself anyways, so I might as well tell you what to do. So if you do have a short-term issue where you can't get somebody to a rehabilitator, um, maybe it's going to be a week or whatever, then you can, you know, you have a last resort, you can do this. 
You have to feed the baby birds warm. If anything is cold, even rabbits, any kind of animal, is, if it's not warm, it's, you're going to kill it. Um, baby birds feed every 20 to 30 minutes, and don't give them fluids directly. They get their fluids from what they eat. So an emergency short-term food is, you can use softened dog or cat chow. You can take those chunks, those hard ones, and soften it up and then make it into small bite-sized pieces. Use a tweezers, your fingers, whatever you can to just drop it in. They usually pop up and gape like this. You put the nest down, open it up with a towel or something, lift it up. As soon as they see that, they're going to pop up and you can feed them. Um, now, this again, this is, not a, this is not the food that you would feed a bird for a long time. This is just going to keep it alive for two days until you can get it to somebody. In the past, like I was talking 30 years ago, this would be the main diet rehabilitators would use. And then they started doing studies on these birds and found out they had metabolic bone disease and all these issues because they weren't fed the proper diets. Because obviously birds have their seed eaters, their omnivores, there's you know, all different kinds of diets they have. So we have like a whole bunch, a buck basically of diets for these birds. And also, the number one thing people do with the baby birds too is they give them water and they drown them. So you can see on this little bird on the left, can you see the glottis, that, yeah. that hole? That goes directly into their lungs. So on a big bird like a hawk or an eagle, it's, you can see it easily, so you're not going to drown them. You're putting a tube down there and you're feeding them. You can get past that. But a little bird like that, you put water in there and you can just drown it in a second. I'm not doing very well with this mic. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, now, when you do get an adult bird, you, or any animal that's an adult, not a baby, and they need, you know, they're down, they're sitting in the sun, something's really dehydrated with them and that you don't know what to do, the, the rehabilitator might tell you to offer them a rehydration solution. So we use lactated ringers and things you would get like if you went to a medical center. Um, the, the most basic thing you can do is just salt, sugar, and water. Warm, this has to be warm. You can take 7-Up and flatten it, make that warm. Or the easiest thing to use is Gatorade. And it's, it's already got electrolytes in it and everything. So just warm that up, use an eyedropper or whatever to give the animal fluids. Again, ask, call a rehabber for advice. So here, here's again the fledglings. This is the baby birds that are learning how to fly. They take a couple weeks, they're off, they're on the ground, like the guy on the right, he's hopping around. People are like, he can't fly, something's wrong with them. They chase him down, bring him to us. And it's like, no, he's just learning how to fly. It's like you learning how to <clears throat> ride a bike. So I always tell people, extend the wing, and if you can see those paintbrush feathers kind of still, he's just a fledgling. He's just learning. In another week, his feathers are all going to come out, and he's going to be good. This is also, people can't tell the difference, and I always try to say, look at the colors. Are the colors kind of muted? Like the blue G on the left, his, his blue isn't really blue yet. He's got like fuzz sticking out, and he's got like a little bit of a pinkish beak. So he's just a fledgling learning how to fly. Here's just an example of some screech owls that I had, which I don't, I think it's the next one, but so they, they also have um, the fuzzy feathers, the pinkish beaks, colors are muted, and they're also clueless. These are, these are screech owls that I had in my yard. I fed them all a mouse and they didn't know enough to swallow the tails of these mice. So they all had, they all they swallowed the mice, but they all had the tails for a good 20 minutes <laughs> before they figured out, like, got to swallow. Oh, that's so cute. Um, fledgling crows, there's a crow. You can see the paintbrush feathers even on a crow. The reddish pink mouths and they have blue eyes. But they're very, fairly big when they come out of the nest. So if you find a fledgling on the ground, you're like, oh, he can't fly. He's probably, those are the clues. Look at his eyes and his feathers. Um, they will also, fledglings will also beg for food. If there's a video on that, I don't know if you can click it. So these are two fledgling crows that I had that were also in a whole nest that cut down and we couldn't reunite them with their, with their family. But if, a, if you walk up to a bird and starts begging like that, that's a fledgling. So if they're doing that to you, you know they're good. They're just looking for food. They're clueless. They're going to think anybody that's coming up to them is going to feed them. So here are the common wildlife injuries we get in are mostly fall, not north, are hit by a vehicle. So they're unresponsive, they're stressed out. They have normal eyes. You can look, his feathers are out of place. But, so this is a clear example of a warm, dark, quiet. Also, we get a possum hit by a car. We're all known to stop. You'll see us pulling over all the time. 
checking the, pos the dead opossum on the road because there's a ton of babies that we can save by um, doing that. The, the possums, I don't know if you know this, but the babies are born in a pouch. They're the North America's only marsupial. And then when they get bigger, they hang on the mom and they just carry them around like that. So a lot of times we'll get a straggler that's fall off and he's, he's lost and he's out there going, Ch -ch -ch, which is how, that's a baby opossum call for mom. Ch -ch -ch, you know that. And then this, this is just, this is just funny. This opossum was in my garage. It's a young opossum, my first year. He was in a box where I had some dog food. And I picked him up, literally by the back of the head, just took him out, put him in my yard, and then he continued to play dead. There's a video on that. He's like, I'm not alive. I'm just here. He's playing dead. He's alive. See? He's going, buddy. <laughs> playing possum. Come on. Come on. He's fine. He looks dead, right? He looks dead. I literally, you could see me, he's sitting there like, oh my God, I'm not dead. Yeah, so it's like, they go into a catatonic state and it's called thanatosis. And they basically will like start drooling and like the whole, they like a stink. If you have like a dog attack in a possum, I'll always tell people like, you know, watch it because if you think he's dead, he might not be really dead. Give him like an hour to recover. Then the other thing is I always ask people to watch the turtles in the road. Um, when they're going, especially now in the spring, they're going looking to mate, find ponds. So they're going across the street. Whichever way they're going, that's the way you have to cross them. If you cross them the wrong way, they're going to turn around and go right back. So I always use car mats and sticks to get, get the snapper to cross because I've had some big snappers that are a little scary even for me. Um, chipmunks and squirrels, they come down a lot. The, the nests get destroyed. Uh, babies can be retrieved by the parents if you put them down on a warm uh, heating pad and just wait. They'll make noise and the mom will come down and take them to a different nest because they make different drays all over the place. So we'll have a backup house. Fawns are also stolen from the bee, from from their moms a lot. This fawn, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with this fawn. Um, it's up in a crappy place. It's actually at National Fuel Joe. <laughs> so he's he's in the corner there and everyone was calling me and it's just like he's curled up he's fine the mom there was actually a strip that went down in behind parking lot this side parking lot this side absolutely the worst place it could be but you know it is what it is they live with us um, if there are flies on it or insects on it if there's diarrhea on the butt if they're following a dog or a person around bleating not bleeding but bleating making a noise like a crying sound or if it's laying on its side then it needs help but if they're just curled up like that, leave them alone. Um, the rabbits are always getting attacked by the dogs, the cats, and the lawnmowers. Those are the three big things. So that little brown patch on the left-hand side is actually a rabbit's nest. So people just mow right over the top of them, and then they hop up because they're scared of the sound, and then they get hit. So for those instances, you have to bring them, <coughs> excuse me, bring them into rehabilitation. Um, if your dog or something is just nosing around and it messes up and they just start popping out, you can just gather them back all up, put them back in and cover them up. And then I always tell people put like string or sticks across the top of it. And then the mom comes and she moves it all over, feeds them, and then covers it all back up. So if, if you think there's a problem like, oh, the mother hasn't been around, she's only feeding them like done at dusk and dawn. So you don't need to worry. They're being taken care of. Uh, capture and restraint for people are always like, I don't, I'm afraid of it or I don't want to grab something. Everybody's got a garbage can or a laundry basket. Just put it over it, call for help, somebody will come and get it. Or if you can't, you know, can't flip the basket over and get them inside, um, you can use a towel or a ski, ski glove or a box. And then if it's something really dangerous, then I would just tell people, put a basket or a garbage can over the top of it so that it doesn't take off because by the time someone comes to get it, even though that it can't fly, it's gonna haul out of there. It's gonna be you know, in the woods before it can drive two hours to get it. <clears throat> so how can you help? You're gonna use your observation skills. You're gonna watch from a distance, investigate if something seems wrong, and then call a rehabber for advice. So I always tell people like, you know, leave the fledglings alone. So people are like, leave the fledglings alone. But you know, fledglings are in a bad position because they're on the ground. So that means they're prone to dog and cat attacks and other animals. So if you see a fledgling on the ground and he's listed or his eyes are closed or he's all puffed up, then you know, okay, he's a fledgling, but something probably got him. So in that case, I would say, 
go investigate, pick him up, see if he's okay. Same thing with the baby bunnies. They'll sit there, they freeze, but he might have been attacked and he might, you know, you can't really know that until you actually observe him close. So here's our review. You're looking for not typical behavior, something that's unresponsive, doesn't fly away or struggle to get away from you, confused or stressed out, gaping, um, gasping open mouth, shallow breathing, it appears weak, his head's down, hanging, the eyes are abnormal, they're closed or they're glassy, and fur or feathers, especially birds, birds love their feathers to be perfect. They need those feathers to keep them warm, they puff them up and make an insulated um, pocket, so their feathers are always really neat. Same thing with wings or legs, if they're not symmetrical, look at them front on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so what's wrong with this chipping sparrow? The answers are up there. Anybody, shout it out. Unresponsive. What's that? Unresponsive. He is unresponsive, he's just kind of staring at us. Does he look confused? He doesn't really look confused to me, he's just kind of looking at me. So he's got, he doesn't super appear weak, he's not like his head's not down. His eyes look pretty good. What about his feathers? Next one. Yeah, they're out of place. So see, see those feathers are out of place like that? That's not, they are sharp dressers. They do not go out unless they look good. <laughs> so when you lift up that wing, that hole underneath, that's all blood. And he was attacked here. Okay, now I'm gonna quiz you. What's wrong with this bird? Eyes are closed. Eyes are closed. Sorry. It's all puffed up. Yeah. Yeah. Feathers Next one. Ruffled. What's wrong with the kestrel? Is that even a lie? Oh, jeez. He's on his back, I think. Yeah, he's, he's, like he's not on his back. He's got his head in the corner down like that. Doesn't look good. Look at his feathers, though. Feathers yeah. Look how yeah. trashed his feathers. He's been on the ground a while. What's wrong with, the, with the skull? the skull? He looks like he's dazed and confused. Kind of off. Yeah, he looks disoriented. What else? Look at his feathers. Look at his feathers. Look at his stomach. Yellow. It's green from poop. All the poop under his butt. They don't. They don't. They clean themselves. What's wrong with these screech owls? Nothing wrong with the guy on the left. But we'll look at the guy on the right. Yeah, it's kind his of eyes smashed. He hit a car. So you can see they're, they're not, it's not right. How about this hawk? This guy took this picture of this hawk. Literally opened his door, took a picture of it. Yeah, that's not yeah, right. No, right? That's not right. He actually died. This hawk actually died by the time I could get there. But he was like sitting there. He, I'm assuming he hit his window and just went to the closest perch he could get off the ground. Hmm. How about this kill here? Looks young. He is young. He was a straggler. He was out by himself. He's a pre one of those precocial birds where they just follow the mom around. If you look at that killdeer too, his eyes were closed and he was trying to stand like this. I had my hands because he kept falling over. How about this baby bunny? Same thing. Kind of like left behind. Say again? It looks like it was left behind or something. Well, look at his eye. He looks, his eye doesn't look bright and shiny, right? It looks like he's kind of squinty and there's like his fur's messed up. He was caught by a cat. That's saliva. What's wrong with these two hawks? They're two different hawks. Yeah, one of them one of wings are all messed up. Yeah, so that guy's that guy had a busted wing, and then this guy, this was taken in the middle of the night. Yeah. So he's resting that way. And he's like got one leg up, but he's not yeah. supposed to be on the ground like this right. in the middle of the night, fluffed up. Just let me pick him up. How about these crows? This is actually a trick question. Okay. What's that? Yeah. No, they're not dead. Those two are sleeping on the left hand side. Molting? No, there's nothing wrong with them. They got knocked out of a tree, but look at their feathers. Yeah. That's the, that, those are, they're too small to be out. Right. How about that kingfisher? Beautiful. Tail looks you found weird. that up here? Uh -huh. really? Wing looks weird. Yeah, his yeah. wings. See how his wings, they're not symmetrical. If you looked at them straight on, it would be like that. And it's like how that white his wing. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's his wing up. Oh. Got a bad haircut too. He did have a bad haircut that day too. <laughs> Bad hair day, but don't we all? How about this great horned owl? This is the same owl, but it's from the front and side. Hmm. Can you see his wing? Yeah, wing. there you go. So like, look at how his wings are not symmetrical. His shoulders are not symmetrical this way, and if you look at him from this way, it's like out at a weird angle. Yeah. So he's not holding them up symmetrical. Okay, what's wrong with this guy? He's not sleeping. Too much, yeah. <laughs> 
Winner, winner, no. chicken dinner, no. click it. <laughs> So Messenger Woods is having an auction in April 12th, April 19th. It's an online auction, art auction. So if anybody's interested, you can scan that little code there or look at our website and it's on there as well. And um, we have a bunch of people that have donated handcrafted goods. Noreen's husband is an amazing painter. He donated a painting. So we have a whole bunch of things out there. If you would be willing to look at that, that would be cool. I'm going to turn it over to Tina Miller right now, and then we're going to bring out our birds. Um, Tina is the president of Messenger Woods. There you go, girl. Huh? <laughs> we have, um, is anyone familiar with Messenger Woods or have dealt with Messenger Woods? Where, where are you located? We're out in Holland, New York. Holland. We have a wildlife animal hospital out there. Um, we've been there 25 years. Um, we just built our flight barn a couple of years ago, so we're one of the flight barns in the area that can handle eagles. Um, and as a couple things that we can do to help, we're all volunteer based. We do, we usually open in the beginning of June and take it till the end of October till when we can let go of the rest of the animals. All of ours are rehab and release. We don't keep anything as pets. These ones that we have, they are through the New York State that we can use them for ambassadors to teach with. They're all licensed. Um, we do work a lot with Cornell. So we, once our animal hospital closes, we can take eagles down there. Um, one thing we can do just as humans in society, one thing that we're having a big problem with is lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the eagles that we do get in and the waterfowl, um, you know, that's one thing that we can help. Where are they getting lead from? Usually people are still fishing with it. Unfortunately, um, are they picking it off the bottom of a river? Yeah. Or, you know, even gunshot. It only takes like a hair of it to get into the system, and it's just like us, you know, with toxins. Yeah. So unless we catch them at a certain time and can get them on the right meds, it's a horrible death. So that's one thing that we can just do. You know, throwing trash out your window. The mammals come to eat the trash. The birds of prey. You know, they come eat the rodents on the side of the road and they're getting hit by cars. So it's just little things that we can do. Hopefully save some of them. So this, and I will turn it over to Margie. Okay. <laughs> For one second. This is Joey. So Joey was a is a screech owl. They come it's an Easter screech owl. They come in two colors, red and gray. He's considered the gray face. He's very pissed at me right now. Um, none of the birds right now are in a very good mood. They normally like they're not tame. You can't like pet them and whatever, but they sort of know the drill. They've been doing this for a decade, so they kind of know. But in the spring, they're all like, just leave us alone for crying out. Like they all, they're downstairs in my basement right now, screeching and hooting and hollering and looking for mates, even though they're not going to get one. But so their hormonal is like crazy. And I'm going to walk Karen around because he's small, and I hope he doesn't poop. I was trying to stand on there with him to poop first. All right, dog. But he actually is behind the car. He can fly, but he flies like Buzz Lightyear. You know Buzz Lightyear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He flies. So he can, but he's not, he can't fly good enough to be released back into the wild. So that's a full grown one? He's full grown. This is the second smallest um, owl in our area. We have, the sawwood is also in our area. And they're a little smaller, the little whitish ones with the round faces. Yeah, the barn. Not barn, yeah. it's called a um, sawwood. Sawwood? Sawwood, S-A-W-W-H-E-T. Oh my God, I didn't know what sawwood is. Is that right? And if you're out at night and you do campfires, if you hear the trilling in the trees, that's them calling back and forth to each other. Mm. Yeah. So you have them in the area. They're trilling every night. Which one do I hear in my backyard is making big hoots? Yeah, they're very prevalent. Yeah. That's probably the great one. That's their wow, traditional hoots. Yeah. Yeah. I have one at home now. You guys work with uh, uh, the uh, 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 world? Yeah. Um, 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 yeah. We, yeah. we kind of, you know, we have them all over there. We work with all the different organizations, SPCA too. We all have each other's backs. I mean, we're all in this. No one makes money. They have a more of a zoo permit where they can come right, and go in. They do that and they can't yeah. allow the public into ours. And we have the wildlife, ha a true wildlife hospital. Oh, on the property. You take donations of food? 
We do. So usually if we get an abundance of eagles or we have some in, um, we had put on Facebook a couple times if you want to follow the page, anyone that had, you know, caught fresh fish, we take that in to feed the eagles. Um, sometimes we get donations from the DEC confiscated, um, but we're always looking for. And a couple years ago we had an abundance of diving ducks come in. They were just literally falling out of the sky when the lakes have frozen over. So in my house, I had 13 of them at one time, two feeding. Do you want to talk about smell? It was awful. But with those, getting them back out into the wild, we needed live little minnows. So we had a couple fishermen go out and net some minnows for us. So it's, it's a huge cost, but to get them back out is, is worth it 100%. A lot of eagles around. You don't really have fish. What was that? You don't really have fish. We don't. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> you don't look so good. <laughs> that would be eagle food. to this routine. So all these ambassadors live at our homes. Um, I know I work with mine a lot. I usually take them out on glove and we go for walks and we just sit and for hours just bonding, connecting. So these birds trust us. And there's never been a negative experience. I'm sure, you know, knock on wood. Yeah, and she's had, it's her heart, we have one of course. But they also came into us with injuries. You know, we don't know how old they are. And there's two men. Um, they were, she's like, never had a negative experience. Didn't hear anything back from you. He did not want to come out of the carrier. Whisper is a barred owl who is hit by a car and he, has, he actually can fly, but he has macular degeneration. So if you look at his eyes from the side, yeah. he looks like an old gray dog. Yeah. And again, they, the owls are like, why are we out now? Yeah. <laughs> I have so, friends at home. Yeah, they're just like. Yeah. <laughs> but, he, you know, he came in, he got hit by a car. Um, he had a super bad head injury, was hoping that he would be releasable, but as the, as the weeks went on, they said he just, he lost most of his vision, and now he, I've had him, what, a good 10 years, so it's, it's like an old dog, his eyes have gotten worse and worse as the years have gone by, so he can see, but not, definitely not good enough to hunt. The first time you hear one of those, it's like, what the heck is that? That, that? that their call, the first oh, time yeah. you hear oh. one, it's like, what the heck I is that? I was telling one, I don't remember, was it you? This, when, the, the, he, when he's in an outside cage at my house, in the summer I have him outside, when it's really bad winter, I bring them into cages in the basement. But when he's outside in the spring, he calls in like three or four, and they sit, and it sounds like jungle monkeys, because they're like, whoa, 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 like literally like that. It's so crazy that my neighbors called the police on me. So I was like, what do you want me to do, man? I, like I can't, so I'm like I can put mine in the house, but that's not gonna stop these other oh, for four boys. They call because they're right. calling each other because they're mating. Oh, they weren't calling to see if you were okay. They were no, just no, calling they, to rat you out. Yeah, to rat me out because it was so loud. People. It was so loud. So I was like, oh, okay, but all right, I'm gonna see if he's he's calmed down a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you can see if you look at his eyes, see how they're bright. You know, Buffalo VA. Okay, and we're always looking for volunteers. Um, and the front of, at the front table, we have the sign-up sheet for the Western New York Sportsman Show and Expo, which is the week of um, the March 8th, 9th, and 10th, I believe. We're looking for volunteers for that. Um, see Brian, and he'll, uh, he'll set you up. 
we have a couple of just announcements from some folks is anybody here from the erie county federation of sportsmen the president or not he was going to join us tonight I, I don't think he's here yet but i'm going to turn it over to jerry from the springville um pond restoration group to talk about an event he's going to be doing shortly after ours Thanks, Joe. Many of you guys know me. I've been around a little bit. Uh, I'm with uh, Springville Field and Stream and uh, the Springville Trout Pond Restoration Project. So out in Springville, we've got a three-acre pond that uh, we've uh, had for many years. And if you've been from Springville area, that's where the kids go on the first day of uh, trout season every year. Did it when I was a kid. Uh, spent 40 years in Alaska, and when I retired, I said, you know something, we're going to rebuild the trout pond. So it's a volunteer effort. All the money we raise is volunteer. Um, we don't spend money on equipment, we don't spend money on labor, we spend money on to get the job done. So for five years we've sponsored the International Fly Fishing Film Festival at the Joyland Theater in Springville. It's on a Tuesday night and it's a family event. I had a great time at the Ridge last year, um, especially after everybody got into a few, you know, it's a pour your own kind of place. It's a lot of fun, way different, but you'll have fun there. If you want to come to a family event, that's what the film festival is about, at, in Springville anyway. starts at 6 o'clock. Um, Trout Unlimited will be there, Fly Fisherman will be there, Waterkeepers will be there, Erie County Rail Trails. Um, some of those folks will be there, $15, but uh, just see me or if I'm not here, um, because I have to take a call um, at 7 o'clock. Um, I'll leave some more tickets still up with uh, with the fellas up front. So it's a good time. Uh, bring the grandkids with you and uh, you'll have a good night. So thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, last but not least, I have to open up the floor for uh, our elections. Um, our elections will be held next month. There's a, uh, four board positions available. Um, there, it's a two year term. The terms that are up are for Chuck Campbell, uh, Bill Jedlika, Nick Sagdabeni. And oh, Dave Dank, who, who took over for um, uh, Gary Coons. I don't know if you know Gary. He was a longtime board member, and he ended up stepping down because of personal reasons and, and work. And Dave took it over. I don't know if Dave is here, but he, he's going to, it's kind of logistics. He's got to run. Uh, again in March, even though he took over the position effective March 1st. So those four positions are available. Um, we also have four officers, uh, Ken Kanicki, Vice President, Tony Messina, our Treasurer, uh, myself as uh, Vice President, and Dave Unetich as Secretary. So right now I'm opening up to the floor for anyone that's uh, interested in nominating someone, or you can even nominate yourself. Anyone's interested in running? Raise your hand and don't do it all at once. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, that's about it. If the gentleman from the, the Federation comes here, I may uh, have him just step in quick because he's got to be in Springville at 730, but I, I don't know if he's going to make it. Um, with that being said, we have one more item on our electroshocker. Fundraiser. Thanks, Joe. Nice to see everyone. I'm Ken Knicki, Vice President. We are, uh, there's a project ongoing. It started last year when I went to Albany and met with uh, Trot Unlimited people uh, from across the state. And uh, we talked to them and said, is there something that you guys would really be interested in um, where you need some help, some financial help? And they were like, boy, we, we could really use one of these electroshocking units so that we can go out to the streams and do surveys and check to see what fish are there. It took us a little while to get our ducks in a row, but we now, through Kyle's uh, help, we've got this uh, fundraising going on. The flyers are here. Uh, they're going to be in the store. They're going to be on the website. They're going to be at Cabela's. You can scan this uh, QR code. There's a website address you can go to. Uh, if anyone wants to send in an actual check 
We have the address and a form, tax acknowledgement form for that. Um, the uh, budget on this was around 14,000 and we've already had 8,000 committed from various places. We also have reached out to some corporate entities. Um, Cabela's is gonna help out. Uh, I think Trout Unlimited is gonna help out. But if we can get everyone to pitch in on this, it's really gonna um, go a long way towards helping Trout Unlimited here in Western New York and even in this region um, do some really important work. And this isn't just work for like a year. This kind of equipment will probably be around for quite a few years and, and it, it'll, I'll be gone and hopefully people will still be using it. So again, if, you, uh, if you'd like to donate, the, these are gonna be here in the store and on our website. Uh, anything that you can do there would help us out. We'd appreciate it. Ken, you wanna just give them a little uh, tutorial on electroshocking for people that don't know? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit. They, the, the unit goes out, uh, it either will float or can go like on a back tack, and it sends a current through the water with these wands, and it sort of stuns the fish. The fish are stunned and they float up to the surface, and then there's other people coming in behind with nets to collect them. And what a lot of what Trout Unlimited does, or the DEC or other conservation groups, they then can study the fish. Uh, you can take uh, the size and the length, and you can take some scales and have more uh, like DNA type stuff done on them. But it's a it's a way to go ahead and gauge. You can't like go through a whole mile of stream, but if you go through a number of sections of stream, and you get so many fish across so many feet, you can extrapolate that out to like fish per mile or fish per acre, and then it tells you. How, how the streams are doing. Are we getting natural reproduction? Is the stock fish actually surviving? There, there's a lot of information and it's really important um, for, for the fishermen, but also for the life of the stream, the conservation of the stream. And that's why it, it, it will last, usually these shockers last for uh, quite a few years. And hopefully for many years we'll be able to uh, help improve the trout fishing in this area. For the whole system, everything involved. Like I said, we're more than halfway there. Actually, if, if I could add one thing. Um, after talking with Scott Cornett, uh, we found out that there's a better company to go to. So we could potentially get two for the price of the one. Well, um, which would greatly help the uh, <coughs> I can give you one of the forms and a, a couple of the tax forms if you'd like as well. Scott Cornett, if you don't know who Scott Cornett is, maybe you introduce him, but he's a great guy and he's really knowledgeable and he supports the uh, fishermen. That he he's the Region 9 uh, fisheries manager uh, for this area and his wealth of knowledge on trout and trout streams in our area is unbelievable. So thanks everyone. Ken, is that form up at the front desk? They're right in here at the fly tying table if you want to stop by and grab some. Yeah. Okay, Jim. Sure. Just one quick thing. Um, just in case anybody was wondering, um, between the two, the, the two fly film events, these are two different films. So we are we're not, not in competition. Um, the, the, the International Fly Fishing Film Festival, and then what we show is another uh, fly film festival called the, um, the Fly Fishing Film Tour. So it is... Two separate movies, two separate events. There's no reason why you can't go to both. So, all right, we're ready to roll here with Wildlife Rescue 101. Get the tiger, Margie. <laughs>
My name is Marjorie Hanrahan. I'm from Messenger Woods. This is Tina Miller. She's actually the president of Messenger Woods, and Noreen Olick, who is actually one of the founding members of Messenger Woods. Um, today I'm going to make you sit through a very long presentation before you get to see the birds. No. So what we're trying to do is just because it's spring, a lot of times people, this is the time when people are finding baby birds, baby animals, things like that. Um, all the animals are in heat, so they're going and getting hit by cars because they're all out traveling. So I'm just gonna try to rip through these slides really fast for you because I know you really just wanna see the birds. And my tech guys, okay, here we go. So my goal today is just to help you find out if an animal's in distress because a lot of times people will steal baby birds from the wild not knowing any better. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and read all these slides to you. I'm just gonna rip through them really quickly so we can um, get to the good part. So basically, we're not trying to tell you to go out and rescue animals. Some of these animals are dangerous. You can pick up a great horned owl and it could seriously injure you. Uh, wild animals are not pets. They can injure you, they can transmit diseases, and a lot of times people will try to help an animal by feeding it something that they're not supposed to and actually make it worse than if they just called for help. We're all licensed volunteers. We're licensed by the DEC and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we don't receive any compensation. Wildlife rehabilitation is super time consuming. It is a volunteer activity and a, like a, people call it a hobby, but it's really kind of a passion for us. Um, the animals require special training, licenses, and caging. So when you're calling someone and they tell you that they can't take an animal for some reason, be kind to them because you don't know what they, what they have at their houses. We actually have a whole hospital, but we individually used to rehab, rehabilitate out of our houses, so it was very difficult, so we came together to do this. It's illegal to take care of wildlife without a license, except for starlings, pigeons, and house sparrows. So those three you could actually do yourself. So basically, how can you help? I always tell people, just observe. If you can observe, you can do wildlife rehabilitation 101. You're gonna look for visual symptoms of unresponsiveness. If you walk up to an animal and it doesn't move and it normally would take off, you know there's a problem. If it's confused or stressed out, if it's weak, the eyes are, are looking abnormal, they're closed and they're glassy, you can tell from that if their fur or feathers are out of place or if their wings or legs are not symmetrical. So if you're looking at a bird straight on and his wings look like this, they should be like this, you know he's got a problem. So here I'm just gonna go through some pictures. Obviously the guy on the left, he's unresponsive, he's stressed out, he looks weak, his eyes are closed, he's bent over, he's not healthy. After he was in rehabilitation, that's what he looks like now. So you can tell just by looking at an animal what's going on. Here's another, this is a little hawk that had gotten out of a nest, knocked out of a nest. He was on the ground unresponsive, he has his head under his wings, he's just trying to be like, you know, leave me alone basically. His eyes are half masked and he can barely stand. I'm on the board of directors for the Erie County uh, Federation of Sportsmen's Club. We're the largest federation in the state. We represent uh, 42 clubs and over 10,000 members, including Trout Unlimited. So uh, I work on the board with Chuck Godfrey, a uh, great guy. He's a past president, as am I. So part of what we do is we represent all the different organizations to the state. So it's hard to get through to the DEC and to the, uh, to the state organizations and affect changes, rule changes, policy changes, et cetera. So we provide that, that combined voice to those organizations, from those organizations to the state organizations. So we're able to affect uh, hunting starting times, we're able to affect seasons, we make suggestions, et cetera. So we're, we uh, belong to the New York State Conservation Council, uh, the Fish Advisory Board, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of what we do, but a huge part of what we do is education. So you may have seen our Teach Me to Fish programs throughout the county. So we, we host two with the DEC and we assist at East Aurora, we assist at clubs in Buffalo, we provide free fishing rods for the kids. So basically, um, we have punch cards for each kid. There's a station that they have to go to, the DEC's there, so they do fish identification, bait, plastic baits, et cetera, how to cast, so we have hula hoops set up and, and uh, casting area. It's a great program, it really is. I brought some brochures to go to our website because I don't think I could follow that great presentation. <laughs> I have my, web, my uh, I'm also the webmaster. Um, been for many, many, many years. I built uh, actually over 400 websites, including a lot of organizations like Deer Search, et cetera, so. Uh, all volunteer, I don't charge a penny. Um, but these brochures will tell you, so like part of what we do 
And this is a huge part. So the best way to teach children how to conserve is to start young. Education, empowerment, and the gifts we must give our children and the tools they will use to make the world a better place for generations to come. We've also, so our Teach Me to Fish is part of that. We also have the Joe Gemiolo uh, youth, New York State Youth License. So hunting, fishing, trapping licenses, et cetera, whatever they choose, sportsman license, we've given away $40,000 in licenses since 2015 when this program was first implemented. We also just changed our, our uh, we also offer a, um, a scholarship. So it used to be five $200 scholarships, but I have friends in academia that, that still teach and they're like, yeah, 200 is kind of light. <laughs> so we flopped it. So now we offer two $500 scholarships and we actually had some, some applicants just recently. So we have a whole bunch of programs, groups that we support, okay, outside of the organization, 4-H Pheasant, Fishing with Heroes, we Youth Archery, and, uh, disabled vets fishing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we are updating this because we want to start putting some pictures in here. Uh, I designed this, um, oh my God, 10 years ago, and I haven't made many changes to it, so I have to, uh, I have to update it. But this has our website in it. Our website has gone, when I first started building it back in 1999, uh, it was very parochial. I mean, it was actually comical. Uh, <laughs> My background, I, I have a graduate degree in network engineering, so I, I come from a computer background and I used to own computer factory outlet in western New York, so I've been in computers for a long time, but websites was new to me and they were really kind of funny and uh, I didn't understand all the coding and stuff like that. Recently, uh, we switched over to WordPress to make it easy for somebody to take over for me uh, if they wanted to because I'm, I'm getting up there in age and I'm building a house in North Carolina, so um, I'll be wintering down there but um it's a the website is, is blown up like you cannot believe we're getting 20 to 30 thousand visits not hits visits a month a hit is you search for federation and i'm on page 95 of google you don't even get to me you're looking for another federation a visit is when you go to the website and if you look at the visits and match the pages if it's one visit one page you weren't there very long but I can see that people are coming, they're looking at the programs we offer, they're looking at the scholarships. One of the things we also do is we sponsor DEC Camp. There's a countdown clock on the website right now, so you can go to the website, it'll keep you posted on when to apply. So what that work, what, how that works is we supply, um, we pay for, of the $350, I think it is 350 or 325, for the camp, it's at Rushford and, and two other camps in New York State, we pay for $250 of that. And we'll reimburse you up to an additional 50 if you write an essay. So it's for kids between 11 and 13 and 14 and 17. It's a one week long camp and it's phenomenal. Uh, so we also offer that, we sponsor that. So we're really about education. We're really about uh, investing into our youth. Those our programs are built around it. And that's what your dues, which isn't much, go to. And then we do a lot of, of um, lobbying for support from the counties, from other organizations, et cetera. We do a lot of fundraising. I will mention that we have a banquet coming. It's uh, an awards banquet where we honor, uh, we, we celebrate our accomplishments and we honor the people that helped us. And that includes the DEC, uh, some po politicians that have gotten us some grants, clubs and organizations, individuals are honored with a plaque and free dinner tickets, and it's a great banquet, and that's a, uh, Saturday, April 13th. God, I just made up the tickets. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, April 13th, I guess it's Saturday. So it's $45 plate, but it's a great banquet. There'll be raffles and prizes and all kinds of cool stuff. Open bar from five to six. Uh, after that, it's a cash bar. But uh, that's one of the other things we do. Our Teach Me to Fish program starts uh, with uh, assisting uh, East Aurora in May when they start. And then we do the city of Buffalo has some in June. We have two in June. We have one in Tip, and then we have uh, one in Chestnut Ridge. And they are phenomenal. They're mobbed and it's great. I love giving out all those fishing poles. I used to be the chairman. I stepped down from that. But the guys that run it now do great. You'll see our trailer. We have a six foot by 10 foot trailer with uh, Bass Pro because we got the money from Bass Pro to buy the trailer. Uh, you'll see their logo on it, but you'll see the Erie County Federation and uh, it's just a, a great program. The guys that run it, Tom Fisher and uh, Bob Avery, have done phenomenal 
with this, and it's, it's really a, a great program. Like I said, punch cards, you don't walk in and get a free fishing pole. You have to go to each learning station, and then we have to punch it. So after you get your punch cards, you turn them in, and you get a, a free fishing pole. And it's usually a fishing pole with uh, like a Zepco, not a, a junky one, uh, but a Zepco 404 with, uh, with a nice little tackle box. Um, and I know that uh, I want to thank Trout Unlimited for donating uh, flies every year. You guys donate a boatload of flies to our banquets. They're very popular. Uh, they're worth a lot of money, and we really appreciate it. We'll be offering those uh, at our banquet and our our uh, raffles, our silent auctions, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any questions for me? What do you do for senior centers? Nothing yet, but considering the fact that I'm a senior myself, you get me involved. Okay. Um, I, I've retired three or four times, it hasn't worked. So I'm now the IT director for Save the Michaels of the World. It's a volunteer position, it's an anti-opioid. We have five locations, I do that. Um, and I do uh, HIPAA compliance audits for medical centers free of charge. So um, I just like to keep busy. I lost uh, 180 pounds uh, a while back. I got divorced. And uh, <laughs> um, so that gave me a little more free time. But uh, please come out there, vet webs uh, go to our website, check it out. There's a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, it's very interactive. And come, if you're able to, uh, look for the banquet tickets. I haven't put a link on it because they're doing a little bit different. Frank Miske used to do, take care of the banquet. He stepped down from that, so another member took over. They're doing it a little bit <coughs> different. They're sending out tickets. So you will get four tickets as the president sent to you, but the option to purchase <coughs> additional ones. A lot of organizations take tables. I got pictures. I had bank, the banquet pictures from last year. It was phenomenal. I have Messenger Woods pictures from the uh, National Hunting Fishing Day. It's another thing we do. So again, Kids get to, sh to show up and shoot crossbows and pellet rifles and uh, learn about, we have the DEC there. So Mike, uh, Mike Todd from the DEC is there doing fist identification. They have a huge pond there with the biggest carp you've ever seen. So it's a lot of fun for them to, to play around and try to, they actually, somebody actually hooked one once. Uh, they didn't know what to do with it, but they didn't hook it. But we have, uh, we have dogs, dogs there. They show how to do retrieving and stuff like that. It's very educational. And uh, the national, the uh, hunting license and fishing licenses that we offer, a lot of times these families, nobody in the family does any of that. So this really breaks the ice. When that kid gets that $500 license, lifetime license, you know, it takes the rest of the family and they say, you know, hey, this is pretty cool. Maybe we should look at it. And uh, the majority of licenses we've given this year have been fishing licenses. So, um, like I said, we offered, I think, eight licenses were uh, done. Look for the website. We bring the win winners to Cabela's, and I take their pictures there, and then we put them up on the website. So you'll see that up pretty soon. Yes, sir. When's your next meeting? Our, we meet uh, at, we, we travel to different clubs. So the next meeting is going to be posted online. Um, if you go to the website, it changes. It's usually the second. Thursday of the month, so if I just hop on real quick, and uh, these are open to the public. Absolutely. Let me go here to Erie County. So if if you, I was going to put this up, but I didn't. So we offer scholarships. The application's right in line. Um, we offer um, it's a five hundred dollars scholarship. We have uh, if you go to events. Uh, the events calendar shows you the, the clubs that we have. So the next meeting we have is at, uh, well, there's a deer fish meeting, South Towns. I mean, anybody, your clubs, actually, if you take a look on here, I think there's some stuff that you guys did. I might be past already, yeah. Um, Chuck gave me a whole bunch of things to put out if I went by month for your events that were listed. Um, so this is calendar by month or by day? Booth. Pardon? We're looking for somebody to work the booth, booth out at the Hamburg. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At, the, at the Hamburg? Yeah, the West New York uh, Outdoor Show out by the casino. Coming up this week? Next week. Ne or next week? Okay. Yeah, well, you know what? Um, Send some guys over. <laughs> <laughs> We're always looking for guys yeah, as well. Me too. <laughs> so I'm, I, I was past president website. Uh, I just got membership. 
I designed the program books. I've been doing that and the websites for the last 25 years, do the, all the tickets, do all that kind of stuff. So we need younger people. My son's a lieutenant for Chicktawaga Police and I'm trying to get him involved, so cross your fingers. I got two young grandsons from him and, and they both love to fish. As a matter of fact, their pictures were on from one of the Teach Me to Fish clinics. So I'll leave these brochures here. They're older ones, but I am getting new ones, but it has their website on it, which is pretty cool. And like I said, um, we also do the Kids Fest. Is that Brian there? That was Brian from Elma Conservation. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll see everybody here next month. Uh, Rob Benigno from Lake Springs and Rivers on uh, Angling Art. Awesome. And, uh, creative process. Good night. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so talking about that.